I would, uh, uh, to start with, I would like to introduce, or uh, shall we say, uh, welcome uh, the appointment of uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, Lieutenant General Engineer Javed Mahmood Bukhari, who is now heading the NUST University. And I'm sure with his uh, with his uh, with his uh, vast experience, he's been, uh, been an outstanding soldier, he's a sword of honor winner, and uh, he will be uh, directing the uh, the the mission of uh, of NUST uh, and making a very constructive contribution. Um, so uh, I, I in fact look forward to meeting him. Uh, may uh, may I now invite you, Dr. Ahmed Usal. Yes. Yes. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. Uh, the, the director of the uh, the NAST University will uh, will be addressing us for for a few minutes, please. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I'm very grateful for your good words. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Uh, Doctor Ahmed Oisal, President Orsen, Ambassador Ras. Kokar, former Foreign Secretary of Pakistan, Dr. Ishtar Hassan Khan, Director General Nips, eminent speakers of today's webinar, respected dignitaries and experts from Turkey and Pakistan, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum and host Yanganese. Uh, I am Considering myself privileged to have got this opportunity to talk to you all. And I would like to start by expressing my gratitude to the Orsen Nust Institute of Policy Studies for this joint webinar. I also wish to thank all the experts in Turkey and Pakistan who have taken out the time to be with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, as rightly pointed out by Hokar Sahib, the Middle East in general and the region in particular are of special significance to both Turkey and Pakistan, owing to long standing economic, religious, and diplomatic complementarities. Indeed, what happens in the Middle East impacts the geopolitics of the surrounding region in complex and non-linear ways. We see that multiple conflicts in the region have collectively stunted its immense potential for growth and development. The traditional inability of major countries in the region to work together has also proved to be a sticking point and prevents pooling of regional strategic and developmental resources. And the Middle East has not experienced the kind of regional integration that has turned the European Union and Southeast Asia into the economic powerhouses of the world. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, the growth trajectory of certain countries in the region, like Iraq, and Syria has been irrevocably undermined by a combination of conflict and terrorism, and also the consequent external interventions with serious spillover in the region. It is also a disturbing reality that comprehensive inter Islamic coordination, consultation, and cooperation is beset with serious challenges and conflicting perceptions. It is therefore natural that a result-oriented multilateralism remains elusive. Despite this general absence of comprehensive regional cooperation, states have achieved economic growth, development, and modernization. However, moving from individual growth to shared prosperity and common development is a challenge that needs to be collectively tackled. I feel that the nature of coming regional challenges like conflict management and diffusion, 
youth, girls, all the time, oil prices, climate change, and above all, the movement of outside pressures and interferences can call for a collective approach in order to keep the Middle East secure and stable. In this regard, Pakistan supports any meaningful dialogue between regional constituents aimed at broadening cooperation and peaceful resolution of differences. Because a peaceful, stable, and secure Middle East means a great example next door for South Asian peace and stability. And without doubt, ladies and gentlemen, Turkey, our great brother nation, has exhibited a keen desire to follow and follow this agenda. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, let's take this opportunity to ponder these shared interests. I once again thank the experts for participating in this joint webinar with very best wishes for all of you. We look forward to interesting, meaningful, and mutually rewarding discourse. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Now, before we start the session, I uh, uh, would first of all welcome a uh, uh, lot of people who uh, have uh, sort of tuned into this uh, this um, webinar, both in Pakistan as well as in Turkey. Uh, of course. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, Ms. Um, President uh, Omar Arsalan does not uh, need any introduction in Turkey. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, sorry if I apologize. I, uh, uh, you, uh, President uh, Or Orsam, uh, Dr. Ahmed Osal, does not really need any introduction in Turkey, but certainly for a lot of Pakistanis, who are who have tuned in? I'd like to say and tell them that uh, Dr. Ahmed Musal uh, is a political so sociologist uh, and and studied in Arab Arab uh, affairs and Turkish uh, Arab relations. Apart from that, he has been uh, in the Middle East uh, Technical University Special uh, Sociology Department, uh, and he's received his master master's and doctoral degree in Southern Illinois uh, University. Uh, pr previously, he was teaching at the Dumpel Pinar and Marimar Universities. Currently, he is teaching in Istanbul University International Department. Uh, I welcome uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed Osal, president of uh, Osram, to, uh, to uh, deliver his remarks. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, we are delighted to, and we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. And I also greet Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim awalan, yani. Your mic is off. My, Ahmed, uh, your mic is off. My mic, uh, somebody <coughs> close my mic, looks like. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, I greet uh, all... Uh, valuable, respectable uh, participants, especially starting with uh, Ambassador Yad and also the president of the university. I am also glad to, to work with, as Orsam, as our team, also we are glad to work with the brotherly, sisterly country, Pakistan, and uh, also the Institute of Policy Studies. We have a very long historical ties. You know, Turks moved, uh, I mean, westward. They established Selçuki and then Ottoman Empire. Some other Turks also moved uh, southward uh, all the way to the Indian subcontinent and also spread the, also uh, Islam and good relations. We have very strong historical ties and cultural ties together. We also... Uh, have uh, similar concerns. I normally, before uh, the meeting, we were talking with uh, 
with our friends uh, that you know very special uh, healings uh, in both uh, Turkey and Pakistan on a human level, on people's level, plus the governmental level. This is also unique. Normally, you see difference when governments like something people don't like, but it is uh, not the case for Turkey and Pakistan and their good relations and their brotherly sisterly relations. We have a, a very common uh, concerns also, like world peace, very peaceful uh, countries also uh, working uh, to for their, of course, uh, their uh, uh, well-being uh, first, but also they always uh, concern about other uh, neighbors, like uh, uh, Turkey is concerned about Syria, and you know Pakistan is concerned about uh, Afghanistan and Myanmar, all uh, Palestine is a common concern. And I just uh, to cut it short, I, I want to mention, you know, a couple of things that the world today is in turmoil and uh, we need more cooperation. We, I I, after the fall of uh, Ottoman Empire, there was a big support uh, for, uh, for the Ottoman Khalifate, for the Ottoman unity in a way, that we see a very big support from the Indian subcontinent that even uh, you know, cured many, also cured many of the, the uh, problems plus uh, the, this aid come from Indian subcontinent and uh, Pakistani brothers and sisters especially. They also did not let the, the Turks of Anatolia and the Muslims did not uh, be colonized because of that. So it was so critical that we appreciate today these uh, strong ties. And we also realized that Ottoman Empire was more than the administrative uh, territories that uh, was uniting, uniting the whole Muslim Ummah. And today, as I said, the, the world is in turmoil and uh, we need uh, more cooperation. After the Ottoman Empire, of course, the colonization destroyed and disrupted many of the uh, po good potentials of the Muslim uh, countries like Pakistan and the Gulf region. And uh, they created kind of dependencies. They always caused e either terror or even like uh, political instability. Uh, you know, uh, economic crisis and military coups that come after that. And all these uh, conflicts, they pit the Muslim countries against each other. I know Pakistan has good relations with both Iran and Pakistan, uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia. Turkey is trying to do the same, but we are in the more in the eye of the storm in Turkey. We are in the region, I mean, Turkey is uh, more... Uh, relevant to the conflict. So even though we don't take sides, but they push us to, to take some stance, but we are trying to stay away from sectarianism. We are stay away from also regional conflicts because these regional conflicts also make us very weak. We, I mean, we, are, we need to be united to be strong, but these conflicts, unfortunately, uh, make us weak. And especially the Gulf uh, conflict, the Gulf siege on Qatar, was meaningless, for example, and it did not help uh, the Gulf countries. It did not help uh, also the neighbors, uh, also like Pakistan and Turkey. We didn't support it, even though we had good relations with Qatar more, but we didn't support this siege and you know conflict in the region. So we need more cooperation. We need uh, also uh, pay attention to what's going on. There is uh, some kind of room for, uh, I mean, optimism that uh, may come uh, came with the Gulf uh, normalization between Saudi Arabia and Qatar. I think things get better and we, we, we wish that also, I mean, they start dialogue with, uh, with Iran mostly. These conflicts, uh, I mean, doesn't help anyone. They, they just keep us busy and weaker. Uh, so uh, we have to work on it. And Pakistan and Turkey can, can contribute to this world peace, even also the Palestinian cause that is also neglected and uh, is a, a sad story. And we, I want to mention, uh, I mean, along with diplomatic ties, diplomatic ties are working very, very well between the two countries, but we need to improve also civil society relations, cultural relations between two countries. I always mention, like, after English, uh, to my students, I, I, I am saying 
Urdu is the most uh, common language in uh, one of the most common language in the world is spoken more than 1 billion and understood more than 1 billion people and as a second language I always encourage my students to to to learn and there are interests growing interests in the public there are you know movies that's like Ertugrul and others that's also creating cultural ties we need to do more on this one academic relations also this uh, event is one of its kind and is very uh, important we we can improve this uh, academic relations uh, further with uh, other topics. Like today, we are discussing the uh, Gulf region and normalization in the Gulf region. Uh, but we can uh, do uh, discuss, and we can also uh, kind of establish a common understanding in all these uh, events. And there is, I think, a hope, and there is room for this, and there is need for this, and. We know uh, there are many groups that's like uh, Petula Gulen group uh, is working like a uh, proxy group for American uh, hegemony. And we have PKK, you have other radical groups, etc. that's destabilizing the region. We have to, uh, you know, depend on our, uh, our own forces, not uh, like guided forces, but uh, also you are aware of it very well in, in so this is the, the beginning. Inshallah, we will have very constructive uh, relations and cooperations in the future. The Turkey and Pakistan and their people are, they always feel uh, very, very uh, good uh, toward each other and we need, we need to strengthen that. But knowledge is the key. Knowledge is power. We have to increase the knowledge about each other. Turkey and Pakistan, I know, Pakistanis are a little bit more interested uh, than the Turkish people, but we are also trying to uh, increase this, uh, this interest, but this is also Pakistan's uh, you know, job, and we can help in that to understand, uh, you know, to introduce or to, uh, to make people know about Pakistani you know, history, culture, and common culture, etc. So we are, uh, I mean, just in the beginning, and we can do more, and I appreciate the time, and uh, again, uh, very happy to, to be with you today, and inshallah, we, we have a, a fruitful discussion for Turkish and Pakistani relations, as well as its uh, relevance to the Gulf region. Thank you very much. Thank you. And your your uh, directions that you have laid down for subsequent speakers about how how Turkey and Pakistan uh, can help uh, improve the situation in the Gulf region and bring about genuine genuine normalization, not uh, normalization that may have been uh, shall we say pressurized by certain forces from outside. I think another important aspect would be how to see that, uh, how, how do we see uh, the great power intervention in the region, uh, particularly the United States, Russia has also been very active. And uh, this in itself has been causing some uh, concerns. Clearly now China is, an, is, a, is, a, is a country which is emerging very rapidly and has very strong links with Turkey and has very strong links with Pakistan. And I think they are now also making great efforts to have very strong economic relations with, uh, with, with China. May I now invite my very dear friend, uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador Javed Hafiz, who has been in the Pakistan Foreign Service for many, many years and uh, his, uh, his expertise is is in the Middle East. He has served in several Arab countries, uh, and uh, he also now uh, speaks on several uh, Arab uh, television networks. Uh, also, he writes for the Arab uh, Arab News. Uh, so he is a very familiar figure, not only in Pakistan but also uh, in the in in in the Middle East. Um, I have. I especially uh, want to emphasize that he has been a very dear colleague. And during my uh, time at the foreign ministry, he made 
outstanding uh, contribution uh, in uh, in our policy making. So I would like to invite uh, Ambassador uh, Hafiz, David Hafiz, uh, to make his uh, his presentation. Um, thank you, sir. Um, Dr. Ahmad, President Orsam, Dr. Ashwak Hassan Khan. Uh, it is uh, a pleasure to talk on this forum and also reach my Turk Kardesh Lair. Um, now, um, the topic today, the subject that we're going to discuss is uh, normalization in the Gulf as seen by Turkey and Pakistan. Before coming to the to the topic, I would just like to hi highlight what Pakistan means to the Gulf and why Gulf is important for us. Now we've had uh, centuries old, even uh, much before the creation of Pakistan, commercial as well as spiritual relations with this region, which is next door. To highlight our geographic proximity, um, I'd like to point to the distance from the port of Gawadar to the port of Muscat. It is 208 nautical miles, which is 435 kilometers, which is about the same distance as between Islamabad and Lahore, or between Ankara and Istanbul. So we are in the, we live in the same region. We uh, send a large number of pilgrims every year to the Holy Lands. We have five million Pakistani workers in the Gulf. The total number of total number of Pakistanis abroad is eight million, and out, out of these, five million are in the Gulf. The remittances sent by these Pakistanis back home constitute sixty percent of the total remittances and are have increased in 2020. They were in the vicinity of 20. So um, we were we received about $16 billion in one year from the Gulf countries alone. Having said that, I, uh, Pakistan has had, um, as I said, the spiritual relationship is not only with Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but also with Iraq and Iran. We've had uh, a very close defense cooperation with these countries when their armed forces were in a nascent stage. Another uh, um, side field that I want to highlight is the maritime security cooperation between the two sides. Because this area has huge energy resources, maritime security is, is very, very important. Because 20% of the world oil exports pass through the Hormuz Strait every day. 
Pakistan Navy has had a long tradition of cooperating and training the GCC navies. In a few days, we're going to have a big naval exercise called Amman 21, in which some of the Gulf countries, USA, Russia, China, it's, it's an international, it's a big exercise of 45 countries. So that area is hugely important. We participate in, in, in an international coalition force uh, called um, CTF-150 and CTF-151, which is against piracy and against crime on the high seas, like human smuggling, like drug smuggling. And we have done that for the last 20 years. Pakistan has commanded CTF-150 record 11 times. So we have a vested interest in the peace and stability of the Gulf. Because any turmoil over there means that our workers would be losing jobs. That our friends over there would lose the momentum of development. Having said that, now I come to the, to the topic of normalization. Now, what kind of the recent normalization to which uh, Foreign Secretary Coca, as well as Dr. Ahmed referred, is the normalization within the GCC. Um, unfortunately, in um, uh, 2017, um, Four, four Arab countries decided to blockade Qatar. Pakistan was not too happy because, as I've said, we have always promoted reconciliation and peace in this region. We tried to reconcile um, openly as well as behind closed doors, and we prayed for normalization, and that normalization has recently happened. The Amir of Qatar attended the last summit held in Saudi Arabia, and those four countries uh, are reopening their embassies in Doha, and we're happy for that. The other normalization that Secretary Coker had referred to, I don't know whether to call it normalization or abnormalization, is the um, new relationship between the two Gulf countries and Israel. Now, viewed from Pakistan, we think that the Arab countries should perhaps have done better had they bargained and talked to Israel collectively to get the Palestinian rights restored first and then open the relations. And we see a lot of similarity between the Palestinian problem and the Kashmir problem. Pakistan itself has declared that it will not open diplomatic relations with Israel unless and until the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people are resolved and restored in accordance with the UN resolutions and the Arab Peace Plan. Now, I uh, like to dilate briefly as to why we feel so uncomfortable whenever our, our, our friends 
our neighbors next door in the Gulf and the Middle East have problems amongst themselves. Uh, recently in, the, in, in uh, Yemen, you know, all of us know that the Pakistan parliament decided that we will not be a party to the conflict. Why, why would it do that? Because our previous experiences in the Iran-Iraq war, in, during Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, we, had, we, we felt very difficult choices. During the Iran-Iraq war, you know, both sides tried to pull Pakistan towards them. Iran said, you help us. Iraq said, you help us. And it was kind of a Hobson choice because two friends, two brotherly countries were fighting. So it was a very difficult situation that lasted for almost a decade. During uh, the Kuwait invasion of Saddam Hussein, again, Pakistan suffered in the sense that thousands of our workers had to come back. The families were dislocated. And again, the demand was that Pakistan should send its forces to the area in order to vacate the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq. The government was favorable, but again, there was a split in the Pakistani society. And this is the point that, again, I, I'd like to highlight, is that any rift in the Middle East, particularly in the Gulf, also has its ramifications in the Pakistani society because of our peculiar communal texture. In Kuwait, on the question of sending forces, the Pakistani forces, uh, society and the government were standing separate. In Pakistan, in, in, the, in the society, some people favoring it, some were against it. Those who were in the favor, they would argue that, okay, Saddam Hussein is a very brave man, he's fighting the Americans. And I remember some of the newborn boys were named Saddam Hussein in Pakistan. Those Saddam Husseins are now about 30 years old. Um, so the, the, the, the idea is, what I want to highlight is that in every, each and every inter-Arab conflict, we have been put in a difficult situation. Uh, we have been given difficult choices. And our abiding policy is that we will not take part. We will not be party to any conflict. Now, coming to uh, the mother of all normalizations, that is the normalization across the, the Gulf between Iran and the GCC countries. Now, that is, again, hugely important for Pakistan. Pakistan has, we, we tried it uh, at the end of the, we're trying it even now. Uh, it is our declared policy. If you read the, the parliament resolution of uh, May 2015, April 2015, it's clearly written that we will remain neutral in order to, re, re, uh, to try reconciliation later on. Now, what happens, you know, I was thinking of a, of a scenario in which uh, um, Arabs, GCC, some GCC countries, and Iran decide to go to war, although it's, it's a very remote scenario. But were that to happen, it would be nightmarish for Pakistan. Again, asked to take sides. It will be nightmarish for Pakistan because the situation today is even more complicated. We are living in an era in which the concept of war has changed. It is no more a conventional war. It is a war of narratives, propaganda, sabotage. Um, and things are much more complicated. Now, in the ultimate nightmare, 
if in some kind of a scenario pushed to the wall some arab countries decide to invite israel to come to their help what would happen what would pakistan do what would be our choices again very very difficult that is why we have always worked and prayed for amity for friendship for cooperation uh within the arabs and within the islamic world and that is why i think we are meeting today uh, to ponder over, over those ideas i will stop there and uh, leave uh, you know some space some some things to be discussed in q and a thank you sir thank you uh uh ambassador javed hafiz for a very interesting and uh, a fascinating account of uh, of of the situation especially the the the emphasis that you have laid on why uh, gulf uh, countries uh, are of importance to pakistan and uh, i think that's a very very relevant point uh, a point that he uh, uh, historically uh, did not refer to is we learned our lesson in 1956 uh, when uh, pakistan uh, i don't know for what odd silly reasons we supported the uh, british and uh, french invasion of suez canal um, and uh, a lot of our arab brothers have uh, never forgotten that but since then uh, he is absolutely right we don't like to mess around or get involved with uh, inter arab issues uh we also would like to avoid getting involved with iran saudi problems because uh, that has very serious implications for pakistan pakistan is a country which is uh, well more than about 70% um uh, sunni and uh, maybe 30% uh, shia or maybe i don't want to mention figures in the sense that can complicate it uh, it's a controversy in pakistan but that can create a lot of problems for pakistan so we we really uh, would like to uh, stay away from these issues but if as he has very rightly emphasized um, if there is any um, uh, conflict in the region it has a very negative impact on pakistan uh, may i take the opportunity now to introduce uh, our next speaker from turkey uh, professor omar aslan uh was a member of uh, the Ankara Wilderim Beyazil University uh he's done his doctorate in uh, in Turkey in 2010 and 16 and postgraduate studies at the London School of Economics in, in international in economics and in political science uh he's a research, researcher in uh, social sciences and humanities and as and is, and is an author of a number of books and articles uh, a very warm welcome uh, professor aslan and we look forward to hearing from you um, you obviously have a very rich background uh, academic background and i'm sure you've written a lot on these issues so we look forward to your your presentation thank you uh, thank you uh, i hope you can hear me Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, good. Good. Just want to make sure uh, first that you can uh, all hear me. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I think this is a um, very timely event and a perfect opportunity for me to share my thoughts about well, Turkish-Pakistani relations, and then maybe in the discussion session about you know uh, well double normalization or one normalization and then the other abnormal normalization uh, in the um, well in the region. and uh, my thoughts on those uh, two events but to begin with maybe turkish pakistani relations i um, i think um, well i'm sure i have no doubt that many of us uh, already uh, are very familiar with you know how um, close the relations have been um, many of us of course um, trace the origins of the relationship even before pakistan uh, was established but beginning with of course uh, if we start with the establishment of pakistan of course as an independent uh, you know state 
Um, well, we can, of course, uh, we should mention that uh, the fact that during the Cold War, both uh, countries, Turkey and Pakistan, uh, let's say, were members of the Western Bloc. You know, despite all difficulties with the with the West in general, of course. I mean, keeping in mind Turkey had problems with the West over Cyprus, the issues over Kashmir, uh, the fact that uh, many times Pakistan felt very much abandoned by its Western allies uh, when it clashed with India uh, in 1965, for instance. So, I mean, leaving all of those aside, of course, the relationship benefited, I think, from the fact that both countries were, um, let's say, I mean, ideologically, or in terms of these groupings on the world stage, we were allied with the West in general, overall, again. So this really helped, and it, it showed uh, in the memberships uh, through Baghdad Pact in the first place, which, of course, later named the uh, Central Treaty Organization, and then uh, both countries were members of RCD, established in 1964. So in terms of these memberships in, uh, in um, uh, regional organizations, uh, Turkey and Pakistan were on the same side. Of course, again, uh, if we go back to the issues of you know, Kashmir on the Pakistan side and then Cyprus issue on Turkish side, both countries really closely uh, supported each other, and I think that support was very much valuable. So in my, uh, again, research on uh, Turkey-Pakistan relations, but also in terms of Pakistan's relations with the Gulf, especially as it relates to uh, Pakistan, many times feeling stuck between Iran and Saudi Arabia in particular. Uh, I. Uh, and in my interviews done with ambassadors from the Turkish side, especially, of course, uh, but also from the Pakistani side, um, one, of course, always feels that uh, Pakistan's support uh, for Turkey on the Cyprus issue and the Turkey's support, uh, consistent support, of course, I mean, for both sides, on the Kashmir issue have been uh, very much appreciated till today, uh, given the fact that on both issues, both countries felt really abandoned by their Western allies. Uh, pretty much beginning around the same time, uh, ironically, in 1960s, uh, for both sides, feeling that, you know, maybe in the West, you know, we are part of the West, but we are not really uh, being supported by them when we really feel the need. So those, I mean, that kind of, you know, membership, common membership in uh, regional organizations really uh, helped. Uh, both countries in that regard. I mean, many, uh, I don't want to go into details about, uh, you know, bilateral agreements in 1954, for instance, between Turkey and Pakistan. Uh, and then uh, many efforts that went on, uh, uh, for instance, one was, I think, in mid 1980s. Turkey and Pakistan really felt that, you know, politically relations were very good, militarily also good, because again, we were members in the same uh, organizations, but culturally and economically, I think relations were kind of lagging behind. Uh, and today, I think still is, uh, if you compare. So this is, a, I think, a, a difficult, I mean, a kind of strange situation in which normally, uh, you know, political and military relations come hardest when uh, two countries come together and establish relations. And then cultural relations are the, the starting point usually. But in Turkish-Pakistan relations, of course, that doesn't mean that you know, culturally people-to-people -people relations are not bad. But there is much room to improve on that on that place, I think, on that uh, area, on that field, when you compare it to, I think, military and political relations. Because again, one characteristic about Turkish-Pakistan relations is that whichever government is in place, there may be differences in tones, I think. Uh, but overall, the relationship does not really depend on uh, you know, political parties in, in, in power, uh, in, in government. Again, there are exceptions. You know, I don't want to go into details. Uh, there are exceptions when, for instance, you know, Bülent Ecevit was, was the prime minister in Turkey in late 1990s. And Ecevit felt more like inclined to India, uh, you know, coming from his own background, uh, and so on. But again, leaving aside a little bit those exceptions, uh, the relations between Turkey and Pakistan really uh, did not depend too much on uh, political parties uh, in government. So it was more like, you know, people-to-people -people relations were there, but also state-to-state -state relations. I think that's why, even going back to the 1950s, uh, or you know, during the Cold War and other periods, other decades too, uh, the relations uh, were good at all times. Again, uh, there may be differences in tones, but overall, 
the relations uh, were uh, very much um, good in that regard. Well, more, I mean, coming to recent times, again, there were sometimes, uh, you know, frictions, of course. Uh, for instance, I think in 1990s over Afghanistan, I think, uh, when it came to issues related to Taliban and so on. But overall, I think what the, the two countries want from Afghanistan is, is, is well, uh, you know, again, in very general framework-wise, is, is the same. Peace in Afghanistan, regional integration, uh, more relations between in terms of the people to people and cultural relations and so on so this was again a similarity in that sense in terms of cultural and uh, you know people to people relations i think there is a uh, much improvement in the late uh, you know in recently uh, we see more and more pakistani students here in turkey uh, in universities uh, i think this is very much a visible development very, very welcome development uh, in that regard uh, in terms of Again, cultural interaction, you know, Turkish, movie, Turkish TV shows are being exported and very much welcomed and liked in, in Pakistan. And maybe a similar development could be seen from the Pakistan's uh, side uh, in Turkey, because I think the Turkish TV shows, uh, I mean, surprisingly, India has a hold on in that, especially during the day, which is kind of interesting uh, if you, I mean, especially... So there may be more development in that regard, maybe, from the, from the Pakistani side. But again, uh, military uh, and uh, security relationship, I think, is uh, improving rapidly and at a perfect pace, at a perfect speed, I think, and tone. Uh, you know, police cooperation has been there, I think. Uh, but the military-to-military -military relationship has been, of course, very much, uh, very much good and perfect. As today, already uh, another uh, joint exercise is going on between the two, two militaries just today or these days. So, uh, I mean, in that aspect, I think there is, uh, again, in terms of defense uh, sector cooperation, uh, things are very much on the ground. Economic relations, I think, they, they, they has the uh, widest room to maybe improve. And uh, so if you just look at, for instance, for the last two decades, uh, in terms of economic cooperation, uh, both countries always uh, pledge that they want to improve that, but somehow uh, it really has not exceeded, I think, even $1 billion. So if you go back to, for instance, 2009, 10, and even 12, there is always uh, the pledges, mutual pledges by both countries to go uh, and exceed uh, $5 billion. But I think we still has not really accomplished uh, that, that goal. And this is... Uh, I think there is there is much room there to do to do at least. I mean there is a there is a target and it is not really satisfactory uh, in uh, this uh, regard. Um, I mean in terms of I think wishes and desires, uh, I could talk more about how again mid 1980s going into I think early 1990s. Um, there has been even commissions uh, established between Pakistan and Turkey to do more. Military commissions and political commissions and defense ministers coming together and so on. Uh, but in that aspect, I think, uh, so what, what we need is more about, I think, economic uh, relations uh, to, to pick up. Uh, because I think military-to-military-wise, military uh, uh, things are uh, moving uh, ahead uh, with very much speed. I mean... Let me stop here with these general remarks, of course. I mean, if uh, there is any uh, question in the discussion session uh, on both, again, Turkey-Pakistan relations, but also in terms of, um, uh, you know, discussions about normalization in the Gulf, we could go more into details about how Turkey may see things from my, of course, standpoint, and how, uh, again, I think Pakistan... Uh, how normalization in the Gulf may relate to Pakistan, I could talk more about this. But again, general framework-wise is, is, is, you know, these are the things that I could talk about, you know. But again, uh, there is uh, many more things uh, to, to go into detail about. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, uh, very, very much. Sure. Sure. Um, Professor, for your presentation on Pakistan-Turkish relations, uh, let me tell you, uh, I, in my introduction, I had emphasized that our, our hearts beat together. Maybe our minds also work together. But unfortunately, there are some 
shall we say, uh, uh, logistical uh, problems that we have. For instance, trade between Pakistan and Turkey. Why why can't it improve? But I think it's, it's basically excess. Uh, we have to go through the Middle East. Uh, I mean, uh, either from the Suez Canal or uh, or uh, sometimes um, very modest trade takes place by road. And if uh, if Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey were to be linked, shall we say, uh, with uh, a very good train service, uh, perhaps that could be a. a and I know that uh, you know Turkey Turkey has excellent. Uh, uh, linkages uh, with the uh, the rest of the Muslim world um, in terms of communications. But now, for instance, now you are building uh, the uh, famous uh, connection between Turkey and Kazakhstan, and then uh, Iran, Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey. If we if we if we build excellent communications, uh, we you know it'll be it'll the connectivity will be perfect. Because uh, what people don't realize that the Islamic world, if you look at the Islamic world, it is all actually physically configured together. Central Asian countries, Middle East, South Asia, uh, and of course, uh, North Africa, the Arab world, we are all connected. And it's very interesting that the Muslim world is about 1.6 billion people. Uh, and uh, only 400 of 450 million uh, Arabs are members of the is Islamic world. We need to strengthen the Islamic world. I mean, there, are, there I, I don't want to mention some of the obstacles at the moment. Uh, there are obstacles, uh, you know, issues between, uh, first of all, the issues within the Islamic world, I mean, within the Arab world, then uh, problems about uh, Arabs and the non-Arab Muslims. These are all, all issues that need to go in. But OIC was created, as you all know, for Palestine. Uh, that was the original idea. But unfortunately, OIC has not really delivered as an organization for the Muslim causes uh, that, uh, you know, like Palestine. I mean, Palestine has suffered. Uh, in, in fact, in the current normalization of relations, they really, as I mentioned in my initial remarks, the Palestinians have been thrown under the bus. And, uh, you know, not very many Arab brothers are now really that anxious to, to play a role uh, in this whole thing. And Israel has been given, uh, shall we say, so much importance and so much access that uh, it, has give, it, has, it has actually achieved certain strategic uh, uh, objectives that it, it has been uh, looking for for a long time. We cannot ignore Iran. Uh, I had the privilege, uh, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. President, of attending the, uh, the, uh, the RCD summit in 1976 in, uh, in, uh, Ank in uh, Ankara. Uh, it was amazing. I think Pakistan and Turkey were on the same page but unfortunately, our Iranian brothers at that time, under the Shah, Shah had his own, uh, you know, ideas about his his uh, his importance, his role, his friendship with the United States, and eventually, uh, Turkey and Pakistan were right that we we warned him then that you will be let down by the Americans. So I just wanted to make this uh, a brief point. Uh, I don't know if. Uh, Okay, that's great. Uh, we, we we look forward to now inviting uh, Mr. Doran to come and speak. Technology and also for to organize these meetings. Uh, we need this kind of meetings too much, uh, really. Uh, so I, I I thanks to uh, Nibs and and Orsa. As I say, both Shukriya to both of them. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, as the problems in region, uh, in Gulf region, uh, as as we know, it makes problem for the Turkey and uh, Turkey and Pakistan, and we have seen what the damage of the Gulf crisis uh, 
bu islamik world also but mostly in particular uh, it affected to pakistan and turkey so turkey and pakistan should work now for the stability of the solution or the normalization of the gulf they can do more things i think pakistan uh, for here i want to focus on five things what they can do pakistan and turkey for normalization or solution of gulf first of all i think it is time to end the centuries old problems of the arab tribes because the problems between qatar and saudi arabia when talk with qataris and with uh, saudis they say that the problem was for 200 years not now or three years are problems so, so what is the problem so we have to focus on this and with uh, pakistan and turkey they have they should to solve these problems it is one second is solving problem with iran In, for here we have two things one is to prevent sectarian fight because as we know in Gulf area the problem between shias and wahhabis shias or they say sunnis but i i i, I don't say it's sunnis. it is the problem between shia and wahhabis so we have to try to solve this problem as well. I, I think the pakistan and turkey can play a good role for this the second one safeguarding them against the fear of iran invasion so when you talk with Saudi Arabian or Emirates or Bahrain, everybody from the politicians, from the peoples, most of the people, they are afraid from the invasion of Iran. So when we ask, fear or not fear, not real fear, nobody will talk this, but they say, there's a fear, we, we, we can see, there's a fear of Iran. So for Turkey and Iran, uh, they done. I they, I can they can solve this problem also. We, so we have to focus on this side also. It is very very important. Uh, when I talk with some Bahraini or Kuwait also politicians, they say Iran will one day invite or not. It is true or not? I I uh, so we have to try to talk on this thing. I think but the third problem is Turkey, Pakistan can play. Uh, uh, and security, security side, Basra or Persian Gulf or Red Sea security. As we know, the biggest part of the world trade revolves here in this two area, Persian uh, Gulf or Basra Gulf with Turkey. With Turkey, we say Basra Gulf and Red, uh, Red Sea security. It is very important. So I think Turkey and Pakistan by this idea can help. Both countries for the security of all these two seas. Uh, the third, fourth, is the security of foreign places. I think Pakistan and Turkey can have a good rule for the security of foreign lands also. It must support against the Western struggle in these places. And then lastly, I think. Pakistan and Turkey should be a member of the Gulf Cooperation Council. So, by this, uh, when they be member of the uh, Council, if they can help them solve uh, most of the security things, uh, this is which things I want to focus on them. But there are many things to talk. But on the phone, really, I can hear uh, what I am going to talking, what I am talking, and what I am seeing problem. So I. Thanks for uh, uh, I would now like to invite uh, Lieutenant General uh, Lodi from Pakistan to uh, to make a few comments on what you have heard so far. And of course, uh, um, with your own vast experience, not only as a soldier, but as an analyst and uh, as a commentator, and of course, as a minister, uh, you can make uh, uh, a very significant contribution to this debate. Thank you. 
thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon. I hope uh, you can hear me. Uh, am I audible? Am I audible? Oh, very, very, very. Yes. Well. Thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, I think all credit to Nest for uh, arranging such an important uh, uh, webinar, and then uh, you know trying to bring these two brotherly countries uh, together. Uh, also keeping in mind the situation in the Gulf. I only have to make one or two points. One is about the relationship between Turkey and Pakistan. Uh, people keep on uh, assigning various reasons that why these two countries are very dear to each other, why the people to people affinities there. They give ethnic reasons. They give reasons of Khilafat movement and other things. But in my opinion, uh, there is something special about these two peoples. Uh, I don't know. You must have heard about uh, love at first sight. Uh, you must have heard about love without any reason. So I think this uh, affinity between the Turks and Pakistanis, but we may not be understanding that what future has, uh, what the nature has uh, planned as far as our future is concerned. I leave it here. Uh, we must understand one thing, and I'm sure that we all understand that, but uh, probably we, we are a bit shy of discussing it. I will put before uh, all, all the participants that when we talk of normalcy in a region or a relationship between various uh, countries, we need to keep in mind that who, which are the powers that are controlling the world, controlling the politics, controlling the economy, controlling the relationship, and uh, pursuing their own interests. That is very uh, important to, uh, to understand. Uh, powers keep on talking about peace, uh, their desire of peace in the region, uh, peace in the Gulf, peace in South Asia, peace elsewhere. But let us think for a moment that if there is peace all along the globe, how will they sell their arms? And how will they control the regimes which they have to because uh, to further their own interests? So we need to keep that thing in mind. And they have, you know, the powers, uh, the world power, they do not only have uh, political power and military power and economic power. Uh, the most cutting edge power of today is their power to uh, uh, manage the perceptions, perceptions of the people. And that is the biggest thing that we have to uh, defend ourselves against. Uh, they, they keep, uh, uh, you know, uh, working on the minds of people of the region or on the minds of the leadership, where they try to create uh, uh, apprehensions against each other. And we also know that, uh, you know, the term false flag operations doing something, uh, A doing something against B, and actually uh, then uh, the C is the actual pro proponent and, you know, such like things. I don't have to go into details. So unless and until we we we uh, we um, uh, we can uh, uh, also calculate the interest of the big part in the region, whether they would like uh, this Middle East to be a peaceful region, why would they like it? Whether they would like uh, Turkey and uh, Pakistan and other countries to get closer, why would they like it? And uh, Within this whole COP web, we have to uh, make a space for ourselves. Uh, I think these were the only two points which I wanted to make. One, that the affinity between Turkey and Pakistan is natural and beyond a normal understanding. And uh, secondly, uh, that we need to understand that which other powers are operating uh, to create uh, misperceptions, apprehensions. We got to sit down and, uh, you know, uh, think of all these things, and then probably we'll be able to pave our uh, uh, way in future. Thank you very much. I invite uh, Mr. Umar, who's, uh, who's a guest, and he works with uh, a British uh, think tank called Rusi, and is also well known to uh, you know, I has been in touch with uh, Orsam, uh, I think, in terms of his research work, etc. Uh, you, you know, please, uh, you're invited to say whatever you wish to. Uh, we will look forward to hearing you. Thank you so much. Uh, can any, can everyone hear me uh, rightly? 
Is my voice audible? Both in Turkey and here. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I think uh, it's uh, it's a good discussion and a good starter. Uh, and we haven't seen such events happening before. So intelligentsia uh, and uh, public servants on both sides needs need to understand both countries much more, and also our respective uh, political paradigms, our respective political uh, interests and limitations uh, need to need to be also contextualized uh, for audiences on both sides, and that's that's a problem which I think uh, often uh, cloud uh, the judgments uh, on both sides uh, of uh, both countries' elites. And I think we should be a bit realistic uh, in terms of uh, how Pakistan and Turkey's uh, engagement with Gulf, uh, how it is proceeding and how it can go on. We need to understand that uh, right now the Gulf, uh, there has been a normalization, but still uh, the divide has not been completely uh, completely uh, eradicated within within the Gulf region, and clearly Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, alongside Egypt, are on one side. Qatar had been on the other side, while Kuwait and Oman tried to play a balancing act. And we have to keep this in mind as well that Pakistan came under strong pressure from Saudi Arabia when it wanted to join the Kuala Lumpur summit in Malaysia, which was uh, jointly initiated by Malaysia, Turkey, and then Pakistan. And then Pakistan had to uh, move out of uh, that summit. And the other thing is, of course, Pakistan's massive economic dependence uh, upon the Gulf and particularly upon Saudi Arabia. And the third thing is that, uh, which is a very critical factor, and I don't see how much it is being appreciated within Pakistani political and security circles, that Pakistan's traditional security bonds with Saudi Arabia, uh, or you can say security leverage vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia, is becoming weaker and weaker by every passing day. So in future, it would be difficult for Pakistan to use that particular factor uh, to balance out its uh, ties with Saudi Arabia, as has been evident in the past, uh, in the last episode, where Pakistan and Saudi ties uh, uh, got uh, a bit uh, in, got into a rough patch. On the Turkey issue, I think uh, Pakistan and Turkey, it's it's a very interesting relationship where both countries they don't really have any strategic clash of their own. Pakistan supports Turkey's stance on Cyprus, and generally within Turkey's broader neighborhood, Pakistan supports its stance. And Turkey has been backing Pakistan's um, uh, political interests within its own region, although we can say that uh, uh, in Turkey, ideologically, uh, governments have been a bit different. Uh, the past uh, governments, whenever there was lesser emphasis on uh, Islamic bonds or you can say Muslim Brotherhood uh, bonding. Uh, we saw a relatively lack of political interest from uh, some of the Turkish governments. But definitely under uh, the current government, uh, uh, building stronger ties with Pakistan has been uh, a recurring theme and uh, it has been very interesting that uh, through different governments in Pakistan, uh, the bonds with Turkey uh, and the Turkish uh, state have only been uh, strengthened. As Dr. Omar was saying before, that the military to military uh, engagement has been excellent, but we also need to enhance uh, political and, and uh, economic engagement while also understanding the limitations and uh, political um, uh, obligations of both uh, both states. So right now we we know that uh, relationship of Turkey and Saudi Arabia is not not really good. And uh, Turkey, uh, in some some months ago, there was an unofficial Saudi boycott of Turkish goods uh, happening as well. So this this thing uh, makes Pakistan or puts Pakistan in a difficult spot if uh, it has to. It, or if it is forced to choose between uh, different Muslim uh, states. So what can be done, I think, is that Pakistan and Turkey 
they move on with this uh, strengthening of their bilateral relationship. Of course, a uh, stronger relationship in the security domain uh, helps uh, in uh, furthering the relationship in other domains, particularly the economic domain, the technology domain. And I think that's where it should be heading on. And uh, thanks to the import of Turkish um, entertainment shows and Turkish uh, media um, uh, productions, Pakistanis are also now understanding uh, the Turkish culture and uh, the, the, the diversity uh, within Turkey even, even more. I think that was a point which was lacking uh, before. And gradually, this will help uh, strengthen the ties um, e even even further. But I think what both countries need to do is uh, just to focus on their bilateral relationship. Uh, and uh, to, uh, I mean, we Pakistan is a is a very weak and economically uh, a country which is economically dependent on Gulf. So we cannot actually force the Gulf countries um, to to to orient their foreign policies in any particular way. And this is, I think, our biggest limitation until that limit. Turkey is relatively stronger than Pakistan in this regard, and Turkey is also in the region. So Turkey has uh, much bigger cards and uh, some very stronger cards, which Pakistan definitely lacks. And the biggest uh, uh, shortcoming on Pakistan's point uh, is the number, is the huge number of Pakistani diaspora within Gulf states, which uh, sends uh, very important remittances to Pakistan, which binds uh, Pakistan even further. So this, this so in, uh, in a nutshell, the normalization between Qatar and Saudi Arabia, some people say it's a core normalization, some say, let's see, uh, or these, this fissure will heal uh, over time. But in any case, it's a welcome uh, event uh, for both Pakistan and Turkey. And eventually, I think, uh, as um, uh, America puts more emphasis on uh, countering or uh, encircling China and uh, backs out of the Middle East, the Middle East and particularly the countries in the Gulf region, they would also acknowledge that uh, maybe they need to have stronger interaction and engagement with other regional powers and uh, um, other uh, powers that have become more prominent on the global stage and not simply on a U.S. Uh, determined and U.S. dominant um, political and hegemonic uh, order of, for, for the region. And uh, I hope there are more such events between the two sides, between Pakistan and Turkey, and we both, uh, and both sides, understand each other's uh, political perspective and each other's um, uh, political objectives within uh, the Middle East, within South Asia, and within generally uh, in the broader international system more and more. So thank you so much uh, for inviting. Uh, Omar, for your very constructive contribution, uh, I think you made some very valid points about Pakistan-Turkey relations, and of course, uh, um, you know, the desire is very much there. And uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, that there are some uh, serious logistical issues. Um, you know, trading through Iran is not easy. Um, uh, that's really a real uh, link, uh, a road link and uh, train link uh, is very, very, it's, it's still not, it's not the way it should be. Uh, I, I think just imagine if we had fast trains between Iran, uh, between Pakistan and Turkey, perhaps more trade could be facilitated. Otherwise, it's uh, uh, logistically, we have to go through the Suez and uh, the, the, all sorts of uh, issues. But the desire is very much there, and uh, we both support each other in all our core problems. Pakistan supports Turkey blindly, and pa Turkey supports Pakistan blindly, and we have no strategic uh, misunderstandings on any score. And we look forward one day to a time when Turkey and Pakistan can cooperate uh, in, in, in the Middle East in a constructive way. Uh, it's just that we don't want to do it. Uh, it's, it's that uh, some of our Arab friends have 
uh, certain reservations. Uh, and uh, I hope this misunderstood. May I now invite uh, uh, President of uh, uh, Orsam to make uh, uh, some additional remarks that he wishes to say? Yes, thank you very much. I, I, again, I want to appreciate uh, comments and especially want to thank uh, Omar Karim uh, for mediating uh, this meeting. Uh, also, very valuable remarks about uh, Gulf uh, relations in Pakistan and Turkey. Uh, I, I want to mention on the both academic field that as universities, I am a teaching at the Istanbul University also I have very good connection the connections as center also personal with academic uh, academics in Turkey and we know Pakistan is very strong on the medical field uh, as well as Turkey and uh, we can cooperate on that IT is another uh, dimension technology I know many even you know some Pakistanis now began to serve in Turkish universities I, I hear them uh, you know, I know a lot of uh, university rectors, uh, presidents. Also, we can uh, we can mediate as or some or uh, you know academician. We can mediate uh, with MOUs, with the uh, other cooperation, other maybe technical events, even discussing certain issues. I think we need to, in English, they say eye to eye. We need we can do or become eye to eye in most all fields that is uh, you know i think uh, needed now i i see a gap between the two sides even though with love you know the the couples don't know each other very much so need more uh, more affinity more uh, deep knowledge about each other uh, you know several uh, technical university rectors in ankara istanbul and other cities like konya and you know i i are eager we know the Interest is there, but we need to implement these, uh, activate the tensions. Media cooperation is very serious. I think, you know, uh, outsiders or uh, evil intended uh, sites, we, uh, we know, I know there is a big effort to de uh, de-justify or uh, degrade Turkey's image. To delegitimize Turkey's, you know, rise. We are glad that, uh, you know, Turkey can help uh, other brothers and sisters in, uh, in around the world, but we, we cannot do also do this alone. We need the good help from Pakistan. Not everything needs money. Uh, and especially, for example, uh, the Gulf, uh, the Persian Gulf or Arabian Gulf, in Turkish we say Basra Gulf as, as a neutral term, is very critical for example the we have to i mean we need to discuss even more in detail for example the stability of iraq can serve as a bridge by the sea and land uh, like in the old days it was like that uh, between uh, i mean pakistan and turkey and iraq is the bridge uh, by the gulf so uh, along with the gulf security i think the stability and the uh, uh, other, uh, you know, betterment of Iraq is key for uh, all of us. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, there are other issues maybe we think of. Uh, I the initial thought was to discuss uh, for this meeting also to discuss tourism, the tourism potential. We know, uh, you know, there are more tourism potential, and that can help. Uh, Doctor Turan, he knows a lot about Pakistan. He sometimes tweets about it and uh, I mean uh, very good uh, potential for uh, Pakistan to attract tourists from Turkey and uh, vice versa so we have a good potential I mean uh, all these uh, I I'm, we are not as uh, more touristic uh, but the tourism department in one university or or sector people can come together and decide what is the uh, potentials what is uh, you know, challenges, et cetera. And uh, the many things can be done on this. And we know Turkey also invests outside on to try to attract, but uh, Turkey is now, uh, the, the amount is like $4 billion, the Turkish investment outside. And some countries are 
very eager to attract this. And I think Pakistan has a, also a good potential to, uh, to, to attract some of the some of the Turkish investment outside uh, and can help a lot. So these are my my topics, and I personally also feel strongly about Pakistan and the well-being. We know, you know, Americans promised uh, intervention in Pak in Afghanistan, and then uh, this become a burden on on Pakistan, etc. And uh, you know, similar promises are being made in the Arab world now for some Arab countries. But we know, uh, you know, if we don't cooperate, uh, the people of the region, if they don't cooperate, America or China or Russia or others, you know, European Union, they are not gonna uh, help us particularly. We can cooperate with them, uh, but we have to uh, cure our uh, problems ourselves. Uh, we have to, you know, join hands in this regard. And I think there is a big potential in all levels, especially the academic cooperation. Thank you again for, for this good meeting and for the good contribution for the, as the organizer, our partner organizer also. Uh, thank you, uh, President Osal. You made some very useful points uh, and suggestions. Uh, I think um, uh, we will certainly pass these on to the authorities in Pakistan. That you know there are opportunities and that have to be uh, that have to be capitalized on. Uh, I think the fundamental point in this whole uh, seminar is that how how Pakistan and Turkey can not only further improve their very brotherly and uh, you know friendly relationship. We need to put more meat into it, uh, and particularly economic cooperation. And I think economic cooperation is fundamental to any any relationship. It's a it's a strong underpinning. Uh, so I think uh, we we very much realize that uh, there is a great potential for Pakistan to improve relations with Turkey and through Turkey with even Europe and other other countries in uh, in in the in, in the region. But, uh, you know, there are other complicating factors also, President. Um, uh, you know, our, we, ha we have a rather difficult relationship with the United States. Uh, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, and please do correct me, I think uh, uh, Turkey also has some difficulties occasionally with the, with the United States, uh, although you are a member of NATO and you have bilateral relations and so on and so forth. Um, sometimes these uh, big powers are also interfering in uh, in our regions. Uh, they interfere massively in South Asia. They interfere in the Middle East. In fact, they are dominating in the Middle East. A lot of people think that they are disassociating and going away from the Middle East, but uh, they're they're not really going. But they are also creating uh, a new uh, situation in in the Middle East. Uh, I think Israel is being given a much greater role now, it seems, uh, in the context of, uh, of um, uh, you know, their relationship with uh, some of the Arab countries uh, that gives uh, Israel some strategic advantages um, uh, and their complicated relationship with Iran. So I, I, I, I thank you for your comments. Uh, I will now invite uh, Vice Admiral Wasim Akram uh, retired. He's a former ambassador of Pakistan to Nepal. Uh, he's expressed uh, his wish to make some comments. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Unjal ekla aur kardamish larimize bu webinar de hosh geldenes diyoru. Bu atklish me dan jokshe urandan. Uh, uh, sir, in my opinion, in my opinion, sir, till the time Israel changes its behavior and stop acting as a villain, there will be no normalization and peace in the Gulf region. From killing of General uh, Qasem Soleimani, attacking of Iranian nuclear sites, 
killing of Iranian nuclear scientists. Israel has provoked Iran on numerous occasions. Similarly, by conducting false flag operations, Israel is dividing the Gulf region into Shia Sunni blocks. While Trump left the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, Biden uh, uh, administration appears to be in no hurry to revive this JCPOA. Sir, in my humble opinion, till the time this Shia Sunni divide is raised and sanctions on Iran are lifted, there could be no durable peace in the region. We, you can only engage people while they are uh, on the uh, same platform. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Admiral Saab, for your remarks. Uh, very useful, very constructive. I now invite uh, Mr. Ali Shah. Uh, he is the head of the research at NIPES, uh, which is the think tank that is organizing this uh, particular webinar. And Dr. Ali Ali Ali is a is a very serious research worker. He's recently come out with a book, uh, and um, it's uh, something that uh, is uh, is a, it's a book worth reading. Uh, and he has worked very hard. His research has been very solid. So, Ali, please uh, make your comments. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your kind introduction. Uh, I think uh, uh, a lot of value has already been added. Uh, I would just like to uh, mention a core area of potential collaboration and cooperation between Pakistan and Turkey. Although uh, on the face of it, it seems uh, not as strategic as uh, geopolitics and diplomacy, yet it is a non-strategic way of deepening long-term cooperation between Pakistan and Turkey. And that area is that of uh, uh, intense science diplomacy and s and cooperation between Turkey and Pakistan. Uh, and we have to look at this cooperation in the context of the need for both countries to advance beyond their respective economic positions, which they are currently occupying. Turkey would need to become very soon uh, a nominal uh, trillion dollar GDP e economy. Similarly, Pakistan in the next decade or so, hopefully would need to double its GDP from its uh, current value. So, for both Pakistan to avoid the low growth trap and for Turkey to avoid the middle income trap, I think s and cooperation focused on the mutual development of what in today's world are called new industrial clusters, like science and technology parks, free zones, SCZ zones, special technology zones, and other forms of uh, special s and based experimental employers is very important. And this form of cooperation, I think, obviates and surmounts the need for geographic contiguity between the two countries. Uh, thank you very much, sir. I now invite uh, uh, Dr. Moyadid uh, to make his uh, his comments, please. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, sir, my deep appreciation for this event, very rich in quality and uh, very well required. Um, they say that, uh, you know, love endures only when lovers love many things together and not merely each other. Uh, this uh, saying, or whatever, uh, you know, is very much applicable to the relationship between Turkey and Pakistan. Um, <clears throat> economics, culture, and people-to-people -people contact in the modern days are the essence of the relationship between the countries. 
uh, whereas there is no doubt, actually, this uh, uh, the mutual love is embedded into the DNAs of both countries. So uh, that is there. But if we want to sustain it for our mutual benefit, then we have to cooperate uh, in meaningful ways. Otherwise, uh, what happens is that um, um, um, there, will be, there will be nothing substantial or very little that will be substantial between the relationship of the two countries. Uh, India is, you know, gaining grounds uh, because of its uh, economic power, uh, diplomatic power, and cultural power um, in Turkey. Not to uh, uh, kind of uh, belittle in any way the supreme relationship that exists between the two countries, but I'm talking about the dynamics uh, of the relationship and the space that is available to us in the long term inside Turkey, and also the space of Turkish Brotherhood inside Pakistan. If we wanted to, to, to, to continue and to grow, I think we have to cooperate in meaningful ways, s and in other things that we can. And similarly, we, we look inside Turkey that what is it that we can, you know, uh, benefit from, from there. Just, uh, I'm sure the August House knows that the trade between uh, you know, Turkey and India, uh, they are aiming at uh, some, something like uh, $10 billion. And in 2023, they are, you know, aiming to a whooping figure of uh, 20, 25, 20 billion dollars. Uh, and um, in, in 2020, 2019, uh, the figure is quite close to $10 billion between the two, two countries. And the trade balance is uh, in favor of uh, India. Uh, because Turkey is importing uh, lots of things, about seven hundred uh, seven billion dollars, uh, six to seven billion dollars per annum from India. We can look at those areas, and I'm sure that in Turkey, the willingness that whatever they import from India, if in case we can uh, do that to the, uh, offer that those things or build those capabilities, I rest assured that the willingness on their part to substitute Pakistan instead of India is always, is, will be very much there. So, and also their cooperation in science and technology, in space uh, between India and Turkey. We need to build our progress in this thing. And uh, so there was this uh, nano satellite uh, that was built by one of the Turkish universities. And that was put into the orbit uh, by Indian sy uh, systems in 2009 and all that. What I'm trying to say is, as the president uh, or Sam also pointed out, that there is a huge potential in the IT and other things and between the universities and academia and other things. And I wish that we could also look at, at, at this kind of a cooperation between uh, our two countries. Thank you, sir. Thank you, indeed. Uh, before I invite uh, Dr. Ashfaq Ahmed Khan, who's the head of the and, uh, this institute uh, that is organizing this uh, uh, uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to invite my Turkish uh, friends, brothers, if they have any question in mind that you need to ask uh, our Pakistani participants, uh, if there is any, any particular question uh, or any issue that you want us to focus on, uh, I think uh, we'd be very happy to do that. Dr. Sub? Well, I now invite uh, Dr. Shwak Khan. He's uh, an outstanding economist of Pakistan. Uh, he has served uh, in the government uh, in very important positions. He is now the head of the, the dean of the of the of the institute and the and, uh, biz business uh, school, um, uh, and uh, is a, is a very very shall we say brave and um, uh, you know uh, economist who does not mince his words. Um, I think um, his comments on 
on our cooperation, uh, his comments on uh, on the region, and of course uh, Pakistan's own economy. Uh, they are they are they are uh, treated with great respect. So I now ask uh, Dr. Shwak to. Uh, good afternoon, Turkey, and good afternoon, Pakistan. Uh, my name is Ismail Sir. I'm an assistant professor of international relations, and I'm a senior fellow, a senior fellow at Osam. Uh, I focus on Iranian foreign policy. Uh, we are meeting today to discuss the current state of relations uh, between Pakistan, uh, Turkey and Gulf states. Uh, but uh, Pakistan into an interesting position between Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia. As you know, Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia are uh, geostrategic uh, geostrategic. Uh, competitors, uh, not only uh, in the Middle East, uh, but uh, increasingly uh, of uh, region uh, South Asia, is uh, certainly in that area, uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, for seven decades, uh, Iranian-Pakistan relations have uh, mixed elements of about uh, competitions and cooperation. Uh, tensions uh, arose from the bi uh, bilateral uh, disputes, uh, rivalry for regional influence, uh, different uh, postures toward the uh, United States, or the sectarian divide between majority Sunni Pakistan and Shi Iran. Uh, but uh, the two, uh, two states have also cooperated in fields that are of uh, strategic interest uh, to the United States, uh, including military to military assistance, uh, nuclear proliferation, uh, uh, and support for militants that pose a threat, uh, threat to U.S. interest in. Uh, West Asia. Uh, the new Pakistani government, led uh, by uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan, uh, confronted uh, economic challenges. Uh, the government sought additional uh, sources of financial assistance uh, from Saudi Arabia and uh, United uh, Arab Emirates, uh, among others. Uh, Saudi uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman visited Pakistan uh, to finalize agreement uh, on new projects in the energy sector and other areas. Uh, $20 uh, billion dollar, uh, Saudi, uh, Saudi investment in Pakistan's uh, economy. Uh, to match the scale uh, of China Islamabad's uh, principal ally, uh, Pakistani military cooperation with Saudi Arabia has also uh, remained strong. Uh, actually, the depending relationship between Pakistan and the Gulf states uh, comes at uh, a period of high tension between. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, I want to ask uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, as speaker, uh, how will uh, Pakistan uh, navigate uh, the Saudi Arabia-Iran uh, rivalry uh, on Pakistan? Thank you uh, uh, for listening to me. Thank you for asking this uh, very delicate question. Um, um, it's uh, you know we we we we want to help, but uh, while sometimes uh, out of courtesy, both sides express the desire that Pakistan should mediate. But when it actually comes to it, we don't really mediate because it's a very complicated thing. We try and facilitate, but so far I don't think we have really 
made any uh, significant contribution towards uh, this uh, this uh, complicated strategic uh, adversarial relationship between turkey and uh, between uh, between iran and, and and and saudi arabia um the world is divided on this issue and um, sometimes uh, uh, you know big powers also interfere in this uh, you know many of uh, men of the many many aspects of pakistan iran relations that we want to develop are sometimes a victim of uh, american pressures so uh, you know sanctions and so on and so forth but uh, by and large uh, you know you you mediate between parties only if you are genuinely invited and they genuinely want the mediation to take place but if it is perfunctory and if it's uh, more pol- you know out of diplomatic politeness uh, uh, they normally doesn't uh, make much uh, sense actually pakistan i mean uh, you know I, I, i've been foreign secretary i've had the opportunity of dealing with some of these issues we try not to burn our fingers because i think that is in the best interest of pakistan uh, iran is a, is a neighbor of pakistan you know we we have actually special relationship with them with saudi arabia we also have very special relationship uh, a long standing relationship apart from the fact that you know mecca and medina are there there there are very uh, i think uh, my friend from rusi had referred to some some uh, flagging of uh, the military relationship between pakistan and uh, and uh, and and saudi arabia that's not not really happening that way but maybe the saudis are now feeling more comfortable with themselves and maybe they are feeling more comfortable with the united states i, I think they were very comfortable with trump but i'm not so sure about biden um and they are maybe also a little more comfortable with uh, israel so uh, maybe these factors are in play but by and large pakistan is uh, still you know, got a significant presence of uh, our military forces there to assist uh, but we don't want to get involved i think this is uh, this point has been made very clear to saudi arabia that we do not want to get into into a situation where saudi arabia is in conflict with one of the arab neighbors but uh, and i think uh, very clearly that policy was laid down in the context of yemen um now as you know the americans have also um given very strong indication that uh, they want this yemeni war to end it's, it's a huge humanitarian crisis my daughter deals with it i can tell you it's unbelievable what's happening in that country so i think uh, there is need for uh, a, a need for an overall improvement of the situation in in uh, in uh, in, the, in the in the middle east the gulf uh, and of course the relationship between pakistan and... i now invite dr uh to make his uh, ambassador uh, hafiz would who was an earlier uh he sp- spoke earlier he, he'd like to make a few comments um sir i just want to flag one or two uh things very briefly um in fact um uh, part of it you have already said um the participant from uh, uh rusi um had said that uh and you alluded to that that uh, pak uh, saudi arabia defense cooperation was was going down um that is partly true and uh, that's bound to happen because number one our gulf brothers are coming up they have learned a lot and secondly as i said earlier the nature of war is is changing um the future wars will no longer will be with long range guns and tanks um they will be wars by other means um so that is one and uh, secondly what i want to uh, but again in the context of of saudi arabia and you've said it already we have our people over there and this is one thing that i have said it i used to say there repeatedly that pakistan 
is one of the few countries that has no political agenda in the Gulf and in Saudi Arabia. We are 100% for cooperation with the friends. We want their welfare. We want their stability. So another thing that I want to say is that in this hybrid war, it is the implosion from within uh, that is sometimes instigated by the enemy here in Pakistan as well as in Saudi Arabia. So in that kind of a situation, when the enemy tries to divide the society against maybe the ruling family or, or trying to put them against uh, each other, it is Pakistan that would be uh, wholeheartedly with Saudi Arabia. Secondly, um, one thing that is going to uh, further strengthen the uh, Pakistan's relationship with the Gulf countries is CPAC. See, China imports 4 million barrels of oil every day. And half of it comes from the GCC countries. And that is going to, in the uh, near future, when uh, CPAC becomes fully operational, it is going to pass through Pakistan. So that is another factor. And the Chinese products going to uh, the Gulf via Pakistan. Third thing, and the last, is that I see uh, President Biden's remarks about Yemen, about Iran, about the region, with a lot of optimism. Uh, about Yemen, he said, this war has to end. And he said, we will not support any offensive actions. About uh, Iran, he wants to come back to JCPOA. That may be difficult, that may be problematic, but again, that is a good intention. So these are the things that I wanted to highlight. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Fees, for making some very useful points and uh, adding to, to this uh, very constructive debate. Uh, I now invite uh, Dr. Shah Ahmed Khan uh, to make his comments. Uh, thank you very much. I think this has been a very productive webinar. And uh, from the NIPS point of view, we are highly delighted to hold this joint webinar with Orsam. And inshallah, we will continue to cooperate and collaborate uh, in future deliberation on issues of uh, mutual interest. As you know that NUST is a globally ranked university. We rank about 350 in global ranking. And NUST is certainly the number one university in Pakistan. Through the platform of NEPS, we and or some uh, can also work together uh, in research activities as well. We can have joint product uh, of mutual interest and our scholars can work together uh, also as a, as a part of future collaboration. Secondly, as uh, it has been discussed, that we have a very strong uh, military to military or security relationship between Pakistan and Turkey, but such a strong relationship is not as yet evident on e in economics part. So how can we uh, strengthen our economic relationship? Here, I would like to propose uh, a few uh, items, uh, which this is just for your thinking, and for future uh, collaboration, that as you know, that uh, Pakistan is part of the Belt and Road Initiative, and we have a China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, we call CPEC, which is a flagship program of, of uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative. China and Pakistan Economic Corridor is not a bilateral initiative. It has a regional context as well. 
And in this perspective, China is establishing its economic relations with Iran. And we all know that they have signed some $400 billion worth of uh, investment, uh, which China intends to do, undertake in Iran and, and, and, and wants to cement its economic relationship with, uh, uh, uh, with Iran. We have very strong relationship with, uh, uh, uh, with China on economic side. And I'm also aware of the fact that China and Turkey has also very strong economic linkages. So I was proposed, I am proposing that we have an RCD already uh, existed in the past, Regional Cooperation and, and Development RCD between Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey. <clears throat> The time has come to revive that RCD, and uh, CPEC can be integrated into through, IC, uh, through RCD, China, <clears throat> Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey can have a very strong economic bond or economic linkages, which will serve uh, <clears throat> the economic interest of all the four countries. Later on, maybe some other countries can also join. So I, <clears throat> I just uh, want to uh, throw this uh, to uh, uh, raise this issue uh, to our friend in Orsam. That is this any? Is there any thinking uh, on your side to uh, have a strong cooperation? economic cooperation between China, Iran, Pakistan, and Turkey. Uh, two, three years ago, I think, uh, I made a presentation in Istanbul, uh, uh, and I presented my paper exactly on this topic. And uh, uh, our Turkish friend, they said that, yes, they are also thinking in that line. So I don't know whether the Orsam has some work in, in, in making uh, to undertake such type of thing. This will have a great economic uh, linkages and cooperation between the four uh, countries. So I leave it to you, uh, Mr. President, uh, on think about this. And if that is the case, then you know, NIPS and or some can undertake projects and work together. So thank you very much, sir, from my side. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ishfaq, for your very valuable comments on the prospects of economic cooperation um, between China and Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey. Let me let me just uh, you know I referred to I refer to this RCD summit of 1976, and um, two leaders that of Pakistan and Turkey were in complete agreement on this issue. But it was the Shah of Iran who was extremely reluctant. In fact, the point that Pakistan had made at that time was that we must, uh, the three countries must industrialize by very close cooperation. In fact, even in military cooperation, even in military production of military equipment, um, you know, Mr. Bhutto, I recall, made this proposal uh, and uh, in fact, uh, at the actually the, the summit uh, at the end was not entirely pleasant. Uh, they disagreed thoroughly you know, because Ms., Mr. The, the, the Shah of Iran was not very very keen uh, because he had his ideas of his own, and he thought that our dependence on the United States was uh, was critical. So I'm, I'm just saying that uh, uh, when it comes to cooperation of this nature. Sometimes these big powers do interfere and uh, and create problems for uh, for cooperation. Uh, may I now invite Mr. Gokum from Orsam to make his comment? 
Thank you, Erdogan. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I would like to state that uh, the Gulf reconciliation between Saudi Arabia and mainly Qatar, uh, and uh, also it included uh, the United Arab Emirates and uh, Bahrain, uh, maybe. Uh, and it is a important. It is an important step. Uh, it has been perceived as an important and a decisive step uh, by Pakistan, also and Turkey. Uh, for a more stable and wider region. Uh, and Turkey and Pakistan, uh, in this respect, uh, are cooperating and uh, can cooperate more uh, to have a more, uh, to have a stronger relations with uh, with each other and also with uh, their Gulf partner, partners. Uh, and also, I would like to state a, a brief point uh, on, uh, uh, I would like to state that uh, there are many Pakistanis and Turks uh, who have been living and uh, working in the Gulf. Uh, it is another aspect that is that is the uh, normalization, reconciliation, and the consensus uh, in the Gulf, uh, the new consensus in the Gulf. Uh, I can say that uh, there could be more uh, cooperation in our brotherly people who are living in the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Qatar. Uh, also, uh, I also want to underline that the, these panels and seminars and organized by NIPS and ORSA uh, will help us craft a more uh, stable and robust uh, roadmaps and guidelines uh, to further this and to furtherance of these issues. Thank you, everyone. I think we've had a very uh, useful discussion, and uh, we all agree on uh, three or four very critical points. One, of course, is Pakistan-Turkey relations, which I have always said were brotherly and uh, friendly and flawless in most ways. But there is huge scope, huge prospect, huge scope for further expansion of this relationship. Secondly, of course, we can think in terms of uh, greater regional cooperation, which includes Iran. Um, and I, I hope one day we can organize uh, a, a webinar with our Iranian friends and our Turkish friends and see how we can move forward on some of the ideas that were mentioned by him. Uh, thirdly, of course, uh, we, we very much want to see peace and stability in uh, in the Middle East, peace and stability in the Gulf, because uh, as it was mentioned earlier by Ambassador Fees, uh, it has great impact on Pakistan. Um, five million Pakistanis' livelihood depends on them. Um, uh, five million means uh, uh, really several million. Uh, <laughs> if you count families, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a great contribution, and we certainly don't want to lose that. But then, you know, it's also a question of countries' uh, values and dignity and honor. And uh, uh, we certainly are not a country that wants to be pushed around by anybody. Uh, we value our respect, our dignity. And I think one, one very fundamental point is important here. A country which is not economically sound and economically stable and is not developing and progressing, I'm afraid, uh, compromises its uh, independence and sovereignty. Um, when you have to go to other countries to ask for money uh, to, to, you know, to support the economy, then that's not a very... Uh, you know, not a very palatable approach. Uh, then, uh, then the country that gives you economic assistance is in a position to to pressurize you and manipulate you. And we've had that terrible experience with the United States. I, I want to emphasize that. Uh, you know, when when some of our friends uh, try and tell us that the Chinese are are pushing you into this. Uh, CPAC, which is really eventually going to be an economic burden. Uh, I just want to underline that this is nonsense. Only recently, a very interesting article has come out from the, um, the uh, think tank, uh, the Atlantic think tank. Uh, and they've, they've, actually, they've actually questioned all this. 
about this debt trap that the Chinese are laying. This is not true. And I tell you, I, I've been ambassador to China myself, and I've dealt with China for uh, God knows from the time of Chairman Mao. I can tell you of not one occasion when the Chinese arm twisted Pakistan on any of the issues. So I think this is a very important factor. So lastly, um, uh, we certainly, Turkey and Pakistan can also uh, contribute if we are asked. Uh, we don't want to impose. We don't want to. We don't want to be over uh, overzealous in our approach uh, to uh, to offer uh, uh, our services to our friends in in the in in, in in in the Middle East and in the Gulf, particularly uh, in regard to either mediating or facilitating uh, better understanding among them. Um, we we wish our Arab brothers uh, well, and uh, it's such a pleasure uh, to have exchanged these views uh, with our Turkish brothers. I hope we can do more of this in the future. Um, um, President uh, uh, Usal, thank you very much. Yeah, um, I, I certainly, on my part, I have made uh, my conclusion, but uh, I certainly want to request uh, uh, Dr. Osal if you would like to make any additional points for the as concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. May I now invite uh, uh, the, the rector of Nas University, uh, General Javed Mahmood Bukhari, uh, to make his uh, concluding remarks? Uh, we look forward to that, sir. Sir, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me, sir. I can hear you. All right. Um, extremely grateful. Personally, I'm very grateful to all the participants. Uh, we stand much wiser on some very critical issues to both Turkey and Pakistan. Uh, the, the discussion was very thought-provoking. Um, I generally wish to extend my gratitude to Excellency Ambassador Edward Coker for conducting the webinar so well. Uh, we are very grateful to you, sir. At NIPS, we owe you our gratitude for so many things that, that you do to us, uh, especially for conducting this seminar so well. Uh, my compliments to all the participants once again. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Dr. Osal and uh, my other Turkish brothers, um, our friend from uh, Rusi, uh, for this wonderful exchange. And uh, as I said uh, in, in, in one of my remarks that we should repeat this, please cooperate with uh, NIPS, which is one of our, one of our best think tanks. And, um, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, when when things normalize, when we are rid of COVID-19, uh, I hope we can uh, we can not only not only have webinars, but we can also visit each other, the institutes, and maybe we can think in terms of exchange of scholars, and we can think in terms of uh, coming up with a common publication. So I think uh, this is something which is a good. Uh, start and um, I, I, I thank you, sir. Uh, it's my great pleasure that I've had the privilege of uh, chairing this particular session. Khuda uh, Hafiz, uh, and please stay safe. And I wish you all good health, uh, happiness, and uh, prosperity. And especially to, uh, you know, Turkey and Pakistan, uh, I, I don't want to emphasize only the love aspect, but we are really, we are really sincere friends. And I don't think you can find an example of this nature in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Gule gule, hoş kal. Thank you. Maasalama. See you later. Maasalama. Guruşmak üzere. İyi günler. Guruşmak üzere. See you later next events.